Hello. I'm Shirley Romaine, and it is my pleasure and my privilege today to be host to poets, my very favorite people in the world. As a matter of fact, I'm surrounded by them. And we will have a chance to talk with them, but we do want to be sure that we have a chance to hear all of them. So we're going to begin with the poet who is to my right, who is Carolyn Raphael. She has really made herself a distinguished poetry person in our community, and I would like to call upon her, and she can tell you everything about what she is doing to promote and enhance and stimulate this community to the beauty and the wonder of poetry. So, Carolyn, you're on. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, I'm excited that we just finished our Great Neck Plaza Contest Awards Day on Sunday the 15th of April, and um, we have several winners. The first prize winner is J.R. Turek, who won for her Five Gold Rings poem, which you can see on the uh, Great Neck Plaza website, www.greatneckplaza.net. And we're excited about this because it gets poetry moving through everybody's veins, and it gets people reading it and listening to it, and that's what we enjoy most. And I was invited uh, towards the end of Poetry Month on the 26th of April to read from my new book, Grandma Poems Not Too Sweet, at the library, the main branch, at 2 o'clock. But what I'd like to do is talk to you about poetry itself. And when I was teaching college English and I was teaching poetry, my students always asked me, how do you approach a poem? And that's a good question. So I think what I can do is just give you one example. This is a sonnet. I know Shirley likes sonnets. I do. I know. <laughs> and this is a sonnet in which I try to show them how you just wander around a poem. It's called How to Read a Poem. Walk up the flagstone path. Don't hesitate. The owner welcomes every passerby. Notice the shutters on the second floor and how gray shingles meet the roof's black slate. Go to the yard where the maple rises high above the weathered deck. Choose any door to enter. They're all unlocked. Then look around. Wander from room to room till you have found the owner's signature, perhaps the dried hydrangea cluster or the seashells near it. Play with the jigsaw puzzle to decide where pieces fit. The owner loves to share it. Enjoy the music that the walls provide and come again at any time to hear it. Oh, very nice. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you. And then I have some poems from my new book. Uh, the fun of writing this book, and the reason why we called it Not Too Sweet, is that it's wonderful to enjoy the sweetness of your grandchildren, but it doesn't make good reading for somebody else. <laughs> so I thought I would talk about some of the subjects that were not too sweet. And the first one is called Outing My Age. As big as life, the numbers of my years flash purple on his homemade birthday card. I praise the artist for their perfect shape. The next blow is his declaration that I'm five years older than his other grandma. <laughs> Subtraction lesson in his first grade class. <laughs> to practice sums, he, sl he slowly calculates. When I'm 18, then you'll be 82. And when I'm 30, you'll be 94. <laughs> I sit down as my decades flutter by, afraid to tell my chronicler to stop. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, another short one. This is called The Tooth Fairy. Our big boy's lost a tooth, the family sings. At night, he buries it beneath his pillow. He sleeps and wakes, trying to peek at wings, then finds at morning sun a dollar bill. I, too, have lost a tooth. But no one sings. <laughs> I'll need an implant or a bridge. <laughs> My pillow declines the ivory bribe. No fairy brings me cash to help me pay the dentist bill. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's great. And then, of course, one of the problems, the big problems with grandchildren is that they leave. 
So I wrote a poem, speaking of form. This is a lovely little form, French form called the triolet. It's very short, but it has a repeating, it's rhymed, and it has a repeating refrain that I think you'll enjoy. Before you leave. Before you leave for baseball, soccer, girls, may I interest you in armor at the Met? May I run fingers through your wayward curls before you leave for baseball, soccer, girls? And how about Rossini, whose barber whirls as fast as hockey players near the net? Before you leave for baseball, soccer, girls, may I interest you in armor at the Met? <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Okay, oh, so Shirley. that's it. Yeah. You know, um, as I'm listening to you, I, I love those poems. Thank you. Not too sweet. Uh, I was reminded that many years ago when my husband and I went on a trip mm -hmm. with, with an elder hostel, and you sort of introduce yourself at the beginning. You know, everybody goes around and say, tell me something about yourself. And they say, nothing about grandchildren, please. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, it's tricky. Uh, yeah, well, I think that's... Really, thank you so much. You're welcome. Now, I think we're going to start with you, yes. Sasha. Uh, Sasha is one of the three poets, and we have all three of them, and they're all going to read their poems for you. And I cannot tell you how good they are. Mm -hmm. And look for them at your neighborhood library or some major institution where poetry is read. I have to tell you that it's just my favorite. I'm an actor, and I, of course, revel in what I do, and I love doing it, but nothing is better than poetry. So with that brief introduction, I do have something when we talk that I do want to get a kind of a consensus on, but let me start with you, Sasha. Sure, wonderful. And this is Sasha Ettinger. Yes. Mm -hmm. And she's going to tell you what she's going to read for us. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, a poem. Um, and I'll just give you a little uh, beginning. Poet Audre Lorde wrote, The woman's place of power within each of us is dark, ancient, and deep. And her words inspired him to myself. <clears throat> it's cheeky of me untamable gypsy woman, luring you with brazen eyes. <clears throat> I've taken the power back from Adam. It's in my fair hands now to melt the sins of fallen angels. I drink from the emerald cup of summer's nectar, hold the moon on the tips of my fingers, ride her flame over mountains into the burning lust of autumn's gold. My heart pulses through the wilderness where love has many names, Aphrodite, Venus, Astarte. I sing them all in the reflection of your eyes. The pagan voice of the poet within says, spend one wild night with me, and I do, I do. <laughs> mm. Oh, lovely. Nice. Poet Marie Howe wrote, the great thing about poetry is that it helps us to let our hearts break open rather than close. Everything contained in the heart. I'm living and dying at the same time, she hears herself say as she lifts the lid of the rice container. And again, her voice echoes, I'm living and dying at the same time as she reaches for a handful spreads the grains in a large, shallow pan with a kind of meditative joy. Even as she knows, poetry holds in between the words what can't be said, white space holding more than one world, a universe of worlds living inside her head. So best to continue counting out grains, best to lose herself by staring at the maple tree outside the window scarlet leaves, living and dying at the same time. Regardless of how many grains she counts, how many sleepless nights, how many times the sun turns, the moon slides like an opaque pearl and shadows follow her, in her heart she knows that to write about joy is almost unbearable, but the words will come. Mm -hmm. 
And the next poem I'm going to read, uh, in this poem I explore the power of fragrance as an aging woman looks back on one youthful summer, lilac time. That sultry July, her summer tanned body, brash with the salt scent of ocean, breeze, ocean breezes, the youthful balm of innocence, heady floral of lilacs along the seawall, seduced her with, with a sweet pain beyond her years. Decades later, lips sun-chapped, she lingers over her rite of passage, smiles at the luminescence she possessed, the beginning of womanhood unleashed by his musky perfume, lyrical words that caressed the seams of her body. She inhaled his lingering essence, breathlessly swallowed it. Tonight, the rose-ragged sky spills past the trail of wild honeysuckle in the air, like a spray-on cologne wearing the skin of her aging self. She longs to walk through that mist one more time. Okay. Some days are to be savored, and this is one such a day, transient moments. There is something about a day so clear. Dawn, drizzle past, you kneel in the garden, remove spring pansies from their flats. Nearby, a robin gingerly tiptoes over rhododendrons, greening branches, purple buds still waiting to pop. There is something about not needing to possess or envy any one thing on earth, unless, no, no one, even past hurt, put aside. Task completed, you gaze upward, your hands and eyes caught between the unquenchable blue. There is something about an evening so mild, dusk blushes over scarves of meadow, golden blossoms like candlelight stipple the landscape, starlings croon their caw-caw song, heartbeats pulsing, they sweep the sky. How does it feel to fly, to swallow back the day, Unsandaled feet lifted, shoulders unlatched, arms gliding, the whole of you leaning into the alchemy of tomorrow. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much. You're you know, welcome. I didn't mention how timely we are because April is National Poetry Month. So here we are. <laughs> We're doing it. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. Right. Next, let me go to you, Evelyn, right. because Evelyn, as I mentioned, uh, Sasha and Evelyn and Sybil are the three poets, and they're very active here on Long Island, so this is a wonderful chance. I'm introducing them to many of you, and those of you who know them know what a treat this is. So, Thank you. Evelyn. Thank you. Um, I, um, <laughs> you know, when you go and try to pick some poems to read and you hope that they hang together and don't sound like there are five different people wrote them. <laughs> um, uh, two years ago, I entered a, a contest on Long Island, and uh, it was to write a poem a day and uh, in April. And uh, I wrote about um, poems that reflected music. So this was written to uh, Canon in D major by uh, Pachelbel, Passing Infinity. Dawn creeps over the horizon, gently suffuses color into grayness, clouds defined by concept of perfection, like white giant mountains, touched by misty gray, pasted against startling blue of sky flourishing its beauty. An infinity of blue, the yearning of it, celestial blue, cobalt of the virgin's robe, container of paint labeled Sky blue. Waves dance in the touch of blue light, washing pebbles on the shore, each polished like jewels. On the grassed banks, blades of small grass washed by dew, presented as gifts on this endless morning of memory. Oh. <clears throat> I write a lot about writing. That way you can't, don't have to think about some really important subject to write about. <laughs> Litany. I am the scribbled paper lying in a wastebasket. I am the window with a view of a fat robin calling. 
I am the blank paper of the reluctant poet and stiff fingers poised on resistant keys. I am the noise of an empty room and the silence of rush hour traffic. <laughs> I am the tousled bouquet of fake flowers pushed aside for a pile of books. I am the neat pile of unread magazines and a jumbled pile of clothes to be ironed. I am the torn out recipes and microwave meals. I am candles on the table and matching mats. I am carrots in the refrigerator and candy on the counter. I am the first laughter in the audience and the solitary listener in the lobby. I am the black walnut tree near the fence, the patch of lawn where no grass grows. I am a spider that spins her web across the porch, re-spins it when it breaks each day. I am three cats sleeping on the patio and a tiny black squirrel sitting on the steps. I am his flickering tail as he runs away. I am the rainy morning and the songs of birds. Oh, mm -hmm. very nice. Um, this has not been a particularly good year uh, in my family with people getting sick and operated and all kinds of stuff, so I had to read at least one of these <laughs> whiny poems. <clears throat> Waking the Sleeping Tiger. As night opens the curtains of morning's pale skin, pain stirs the rumpled sheets. The sleeping tiger wakes. Your arms reach and hide, yearning for surcease. Body curls into a frenzied circle of worthless armor. Pinked sky besmirched by torn clouds hovers outside fogged windows, and you look for the hidden place where awakened tiger lurks. We, um, three poets and three others, meet once a week and we give each other prompts. Mm -hmm. And um, this was a prompt to try to connect past and present. Cat's eyes, then and now. The black and white cat jumps to my waiting lap, settles herself as she turns in circles, claws extended, kneading her pleasure in folds of a blanket until she comes close, looks intently into my eyes. I smile into her green ones. We study each other, comfortable companions of many evenings here in this warm living room, well-worn lounge chair. Backyard green grass spreads itself under the rocking chair near a giant apple tree. Support for my jumping follies, worried observer of my bruised landings. I hold a large cat on my scrawny lap, both of us staring at the camera, unsmiling. My skinny, bare legs sticking out under lounging pet as he turns, looks into my eyes, safe, safe mirrors of his own. Now I remember, and this is written for three of my friends. I said, nobody cares about my pain. I said, mark this truth in my journal. I take this back and unsay it. Like a welcome splash of warm water on sleep encrusted eyelids, a poem has awakened me. Just yesterday, three friends, without fuss or formality, took my need, took my hand, cared for me. I had forgotten how satisfying caring is. I too have reached out my hands to others. The touch of skin rewards both palms. I had forgotten the days of friends joined in evenings of noise and quiet, serious discussions and playful romps, adolescence hidden under grown-up veneer. I have forgotten too much, it seems. Those days are not yet over. And I'm the, uh, I'm the, um, the humorous one in the three poets. 
So uh, I'll end with a smile. <laughs> Very necessary. <laughs> this was also assi an assignment to uh, uh, repeat three lines, same lines. You always think. You always think you can sit down at the computer, write a poem with a modicum of effort. You always think there is some magic button to instantly turn on original thoughts. You have thrown the bait into the water. The fish are not biting this time around. Poke around, scrabble in the memory bank. Pick a darling phrase. Try to resuscitate it. There isn't anything here. There isn't anything here. There isn't anything here. <laughs> it usually does the trick to act with confidence, start polishing tried and true themes, language, get surreal, then try real. <laughs> grasp at straws of humor. Now, just gasp. There just isn't anything here. There just isn't anything here. There just isn't anything here. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Yes. <laughs> we sh I should mention that you also teach. Yes, I teach poetry. at the Cumberland School. Yeah. Um, a um, 14 amazing adult learners. Mm -hmm. uh, they all have hover around between 80 and 97. <laughs> Makes me feel really young. <laughs> they act like fourth graders, and uh, we have. A wonderful time. Well, they yeah. have only only good to speak of you. <laughs> That's true. Uh, and, and a third a member of the three poets is my friend and Sybil Bank, whose poems I I really enjoy so much. And she's a, really such a great person. So Sybil, you're on. Thank you. Well, for me, memories and objects are inextricably intertwined the past life by objects, the Chinese porcelain plate on the midnight market in Hangzhou now has its place on a dark walnut table, echoes colors of blue hydrangeas <clears throat> in a reflecting glass vase. The market memories of smudgy heat, clattering shouts <clears throat> of vendors in duet with pleas <clears throat> from buyers rising under misty yellow lamp bulbs. The low wooden tea houses, whistling kettles, 33 fragrant tea leaf choices, wafting aromas of ginger chamomile hibiscus, wheeled carts bearing piles of soft buns, popping beads of oil and sugar. We are our memories. Twisted trees are terrazin, weeping gravestones under a Prague slate sky. We shiver in the heat, trace names, place small stones on tombs with trembling hands, leave something of ourselves behind. Langston Hughes once wrote, my soul has run deep like the rivers. This poem, Stranger. Through the windows, a prism of light caresses my grandmother's Russian silver candlesticks, stretching tall on the walnut table. She wraps them into socks at the bottom of her suitcase when she comes by boat to South Africa, escaping a ravaging Europe. In the new land, she wanders around the town square, gazes at curved bottles greened from ocean tides, books in faded leather covers, ivory teething rings, gleaming blue rosary beads, Jesus on the cross, next to Eastern European engraved goblets. She buys a small Sabbath wine cup, Dreams of old longings, memories wakened, touches, looks, sees, buyers bargain for objects that soothe their past experiences, like tasting a fruit eaten in a faraway place. All this under brilliant blue skies with aromas drifting from buckets of roses, buttercups, calla lilies, and more smells of strange guava fruit, dare her to taste their pink insides. She pauses before woven baskets, 
stone sculptures of proud, full-lipped Africans, kings and queens, who too had lost everything in the capture of their lands. She weeps. Mary Oliver, one of my favorite mm, poets, says, doesn't everything die at last and you too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one and precious life? Two fragments. I catch an image of myself in the window of passing train, a carefree girl on her way to the beach, where she will meet her friends on this brilliantly blue summer day. They will change into bathing suits, lay towels on hot sand, claim the spot as theirs alone. Dashing through low tide, they dive, swim, float in a paradise of beauty and calm where nature's gifts are laid as in a medieval feast, the buffet bounteous as the continuously replenishing waves. It seems so near. I smell the salty whip of wind, feel the hot beat of sun on my back. Sixty-eight years later, I'm a lunge of nostalgia. I tread carefully, move slowly into lapping waves. I cannot stop the tide of time. I never knew that hope could be so strong. High winds threaten the wine of tree prunes everywhere. Cirque de Soleil. The arborist controls the drama shouts directions to his acrobatic assistant, light-footed as Ariel, suspended on this early autumn day by ropes and pulleys, his yellow jacket a companion color to the flowers that plopped onto summer's green grass, a cascade of yearning golden stamens. Those still clinging to this huge mother <coughs> tulip tree, their petal petticoats tightly bound in dry cones are downed by the scalpel. Branches layered with verdigris float down poles, caught in a complex balancing waltz choreographed from below. The medieval blade curves and cuts fish lines of <coughs> ivy, a scarlet belt holding glinting knives and clippers flashes color. Sun spools in pale morning glimmer, a cunning breeze. Blue jay fluffs its feathers in warning. My aerial, with the assurance of a woodsman testing weight and breath, grips his ropes, feels for the metal ladder, joins us on earth. I applaud, <laughs> I am humbled. Much talk about lead lights now. But what about power outages? Darkened windows, trees, skeletons bracing for night, unfriendly clouds, a twitch of sun reflects through windows, the room, bookcases, wildflowers in a green-blue vase, sky in twilight blush, lavender rush before dusk, obscure moon throbs in gathering mist, power blinks, neighborhood trapped, a short winter day when caught in a street without lights. Cautious drivers, walkers feel their way in inky blackness, natural sky, the naked night with stars, a presence all its own. Tuesday is exercise day. No idling announces a sign outside the social center. Where cars may not linger, yet drivers remain, dangling keys after the seated yoga meditation class, still relishing the sighs of their exhaled wounds, accompanied by the sweet aromas of lavender. Their fears stilled, their hopes raised, reluctant to part, bending their necks like sunflower stalks, exchanging tales of aching limbs, book groups, and of course, elections. Cacophony of rising sound, of those who share waning strengths, determined to stay on, walking if not running. 
holding tight onto canes, glorying in the warmth of an early spring day and the sisterhood of women. I think that's it. Last one. Is that it? Going to be the last. One is there a last one? Warning. Okay. Melting <coughs> snow shimmers the beach park. Mushy grass, geese droppings, debris shambles the coarse sound, dry husks, dulled flowers, feathers, splayed dead hawk, brindled bark, crushed shells, twine, stone twigs like a canal collage. Waves lapis blue in the hush roll, beige foam and undulating beige collar. Fiercely beautiful osprey hovers, hovers over water. Grisp thick fish in its talons, lifts silvery head, flies hard in throat of wind to a raucous mate nesting high above water. Winter's weight is lifting, spring's greening beckons for Scythia's triumphant burst, magnolia's gentle pinks. But sun and warm breezes are not enough to melt the chill from the sky's blue edges, bluster of winter's grip. My stay. <laughs> oh, lovely. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, all of you. Um, I would like to just go around and if you each would say when people can see you. Now, you're going to be here in Great Neck, so will you tell us again when? Yes, certainly. On uh, Thursday, April 26th at 2 o'clock, I'll be reading um, mostly for my new grandma book at the main branch of the library, uh -huh. the Great Neck Library. And how about yeah, you? Yeah, uh, Ev and Sybil and myself, we're going to be at the Smithtown Library on uh, May 3rd, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lisa James runs that poetry uh, reading and uh, at 6 o'clock. And then on June 6th, we're going to be reading at the Women's Space here in Great Neck. Uh -huh. So we're oh, looking nice. forward so that, to that. Women's Space is in the, at the Social yes. Center. Mm -hmm. okay, so we're looking forward great. to it. I just want to say that this month has really been marvelous, that I've had a chance to do, oh, I think, some 10 programs wow. on Edna St. Vincent Millay. Mm -hmm. And it's really been, I, I just can't tell you how much I've enjoyed it. It's just wonderful. And each time I do it, I think that happens. Each mm -hmm. time I do it, there's something new mm -hmm. and something interesting, and I just... <laughs> I've written a poem Yeah, about I her. feel like I'm sort of in my element. I don't it's write it, is. but I do like to interpret it, and I think right. it's really wonderful. I did want to uh, ask each of you in a minute what it is that gets your creative juices going. You kind of indicated there are times when it doesn't go. No. <laughs> but it would be interesting to know what gets you going. Then you write a poem about it doesn't going. go. <laughs> but I have something that I found a long time ago, and people always say, well, what is it? Poetry, some people read it this way, some people don't rhyme, some people do this, do that. And it just occurred to me that this was so inclusive and good. Tell me what your reaction is. It's poetry is that literary form through which man has given rhythmic expression to his most imaginative and intense perceptions of himself and his universe, and herself and her universe. In poetry, the language is selected and concentrated into words words so chosen and arranged that they convey an intense emotional experience to the reader or the listener through the union of theme, language, sound, and rhythm. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good to you? Well, of course it all sounds good to me, but for me personally, uh, I think as I grow older, I'm beginning to understand that poetry uh, is the search for my soul. Uh -huh. And I think as poets, uh, we are searching for our souls. Poetry allows me to express the inexpressible so that I'm able to get beneath the surface of my everyday yeah. life and the thoughts and feelings that I have often uh, come about in the form of a persona poem, which is uh, a third person, another person. I remove myself from yeah. the first pronoun. Yeah. And in that way, I'm able to really, really get into the poem and get into whatever it is that I need to express. Well, it is an yeah. intense perception of yourself. Yeah, it, well, yes, yeah. it is. And there are times when 
It's not as though you have a muse who's sitting on your shoulder and <laughs> saying, well, it's Monday morning, so let's get going, you know? <laughs> yes. There are just moments when, as Ev said, nothing is happening. And then there are other moments, very often in the middle of the night, <laughs> when a line goes floating over your head, yeah, you know? Yeah. And, uh, oh, I've got to write that down. I mean, I really must get up and write that down. Yeah. And so um, you do. You get up and you write it down, because if you don't, you won't remember it the next <laughs> morning. You know that. Yeah. And you write it down. And um, it's a longing for me. There are times when I have a longing. There is something inside me that needs uh -huh. to say something. To say it. And it could be about very many things or nothing. Yeah. But um, I think that's what poetry yeah. is for me. And it's allowed me to grow as a person. It's mm -hmm. allowed me to grow as a woman. And it's allowed me to embrace uh, the power of white. Yeah. How eloquent that is. Thank you. <laughs> and how, how on target. How about you? Well, mine isn't nearly as elegant. I just um, walk around with pencil and paper, usually pen and paper, and I have... Uh, pen and paper all over my house, mm -hmm. in various <laughs> places, because I never know when I'm going to have to write down, as you said, a line, yeah. or even a thought. But the most interesting things spark my interest. Uh, it'll be a phrase from a song, or certainly a picture, or a child who is not one of mine, just somebody I see that reminds me, who reminds me of something that I want to write about, or a memory, or certainly a book or a poem. But um, I have a wonderful poet friend who read here for us many years ago, Rena Espayat, mm -hmm. um, who loves writing in form because she says it's like dancing in a box. And that's an image I've always loved, <laughs> you know. And it's great. Yes. Not an imprisoning box, but mm -hmm. a box that will allow yeah. her to well, like see her limits. Yeah, it gives and, you some um, form. And I'm always moving back and forth between form and free verse. And I, too, love to write mm. poems in um, another person's voice. They mm -hmm. call them sometimes persona poems. And um, I like the freedom of really trying to be somebody else, mm -hmm. especially somebody historical. Mm -hmm. You know, as a matter of fact, I think I just told the ladies that uh, when I saw Farinelli, I had written a poem about Farinelli mm -hmm. called Il Castrato, because he was... The play Farinelli, yeah. that was just the play, done musical. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I just sent it to um, Mark Rylance, who played mm -hmm. the Spanish king, not Farinelli, and he actually wrote back to me. So yes. when you talk about poetry mm -hmm. having effect, yeah. it still does. Yeah. Oh, I'll just add one more thing to that, and that was wonderful, really. But, you know, uh, people, many people seem to think that poetry has to be something very spectacular. Uh, but poetry, for the most part, can be about the tiniest moment. Oh, yes. You know, the tiniest right. moment. Yeah. It doesn't have to oh, be about no. a spectacular <laughs> moment or an, a yeah. spectacular event. It's sometimes the tiniest <laughs> moment. Yeah. You know that gets that gets yeah. you going yeah. into a poem, and very often, if it very often, poetry really hits a nerve, and it does get you going. Mm -hmm. It can be about something very small. It can be about not being able sure. to write a poem. You know, Absolutely, it can be a variety of things. How about you, Sybil? Does this ring a bell for anything? I think everything you know rings a bell, but you don't know when that bell is really going to ring. Kind of ring. And you can be just anywhere. You can be walking down Broadway and you can mm -hmm. see people sitting on the sidewalk and you say, gosh, there's a poem. Mm -hmm. You can be at the theatre and you can look at all the people and you can think about them and yeah. their lives. And for me, nature is very much predominant in the way I appreciate life. And every morning to me is beautiful in the terms of the garden, the flowers. And then suddenly, as Sasha says, a sentence will come to you. Just one little sentence. Yeah. In fact, yesterday, I looked at my poems and I said, so many of them are about tables. I think I'll write a poem about tables. It just, it strikes you just out of the blue that you want to write a specific poem and you don't know where it comes from. And then you sit down and write and lo and behold, the poem takes over and it seems to write itself. Yeah. It seems to call on memory, nostalgia, experience, hope, grief, love. Yeah. Everything that everyone can experience. Yeah. And yeah. I think often of people in early times when they actually listened to poetry yeah. and there was something about the rhythm and the tone and the beauty of it. And even in times past, drums were used, all kinds of music was used in poetry. Yeah. And I think this is what I love so much about it, 
the rhythm, the tone, the light, the dark, which we all express in the poems that just come from somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And how about you? Well, um, um, sometimes when I think, well, what is my subject matter, that I go, I have no idea. Um, I remember, I have to say two things that I should think I should say. The three poets, we got together uh, to do these workshops because people, if you say, I write poetry, they go, oh, <clears throat> well, I don't know very much about poetry. Yeah. Yeah. And underneath that is, and I don't yeah. plan yeah. to look. Yeah. But uh, so we said, <laughs> let's, why don't we do something? Why don't we do workshops that simplify poetry? Say, you know, hey, this is just the same. Yeah. And that's how we started. Yeah. So I wanted to say that. Um, I, um, I guess I could say I started writing poetry um, in, uh, at Columbia in the 50s, and Marianne Moore was my teacher. Uh -huh. I come from a family, I had no idea who Marianne Moore was, or practically anybody. And uh, so, like, you know, 45 years later, I went, oh, my God, my teacher was Marianne Moore. <laughs> um, I, I actually was a visual artist for very many years. And at one point in the very early 90s, I started jotting down lines in my artwork. And then I decided to get rid of the artwork and just stay it with the so writing. Good. I, uh, I, too, you know, I, I just echo... Um, a lot of my work is about trauma, uh, it's about survival, it's about, um, um, I don't know, uh, putting into words so that the pain goes away. I would say a lot of it is like that. So I, you know, sometimes I write about very beautiful sunsets and that kind of thing. I, um, to April uh, ago, there's a contest that you write a poem every day for the month of April. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about um, music, and uh, so each day, and uh, won the first place award for that. Yeah. So yes. I can be, I can be very poetic also. <coughs> but I, I think that I'm the comedy relief in our group. <laughs> and I'm the surrealist. And there you go. I'm the surrealist. <laughs> and Sybil is the dramatist. Yeah. So we were, we're very good together, the three well, of us. Well, I just really want to thank our four <laughs> poets, <laughs> our three poets plus one, uh, for just a wonderful opportunity to explore what it is that you do. Thank you. And thank you. not only do I hope this has kind of heightened your awareness of poets and what they write, the poetry and where it comes from, and maybe uh, follow them around and maybe look to that thing in yourself. Um, maybe there's a poet or maybe there's a something in there in your own persona that you like to express or you would like to take time to feel. Because if you're missing poetry, I think you're really missing something important in your life. So here's to poetry. Yay. Yes, long yes. may it Thank live. You. It's had a long run. And uh, Let's hope it has a very big future. And once again, thank you. This thank was you. really, thank you. This thank was you really very just much. a wonderful thank you. opportunity to celebrate us. National mm -hmm. Poetry Month. I'm Shirley Romaine, and it's been, as I said, my pleasure and my privilege to be host to these remarkable women poets. <laughs> thank you.